All right. Uh, so, so Bruce said my paper was about striking while the iron is hot, and I actually really like that characterization. So I'm going to steal that and pretend I came up with it. Um, but thank you to, to Chris and Bruce and all the conference organizers for inviting me. Thank you all for attending. It's great to be here. Uh, I feel a little bit of extra pressure as the first speaker of the day to be hopefully interesting so that you guys don't leave. If, you, if, if I bore you and you all leave, I think these guys are going to be very upset at me. Um, but as kind of Bruce indicated, uh, the, the title of the paper, Anomaly Time, gives a little bit of an idea of what we're going to do. Uh, the basic idea is we want to think about these asset pricing anomalies, these variables that are thought to predict future abnormal returns. And we want to think a little bit about when they actually earn returns and when they don't. Right? Uh, and, and so hopefully that exercise will help us learn something more about the nature of anomalies and, and what's going on. So big picture, I'm sure I don't need to introduce the idea of an anomaly to the people in this room. Um, but if you look, there are literally hundreds of asset pricing anomalies that have been documented in the current academic literature. Uh, so my, my co-authors, David McLean and Jeff Pontef, have a paper where they look at a lot of anomalies. They look at 93 different ones that have been published. They've since expanded their list to 140. Uh, basically, as soon as you make a list of anomalies, it's outdated. There's new ones that have been discovered already. Uh, a couple of other people have expanded these lists. They've looked at all the different ways in which people have constructed the anomalies. If you count for all the variations on these things, you can easily come up with a list approaching 500 different asset pricing anomalies. Right? And if you believe these all, if you take them all at face value, these are all apparent violations of market efficiency. Right? So there's big picture implications for all of this. That having been said, there's an interesting result in a lot of the recent academic literature. Several different papers have all come to the same conclusion. When you look at the data today, most of those anomalies are not there. They're gone. Right? So, so what's going on here? Well, if you read what the academic literature is saying, you'll actually come up with kind of two opposing viewpoints. So on the one hand, Jeff and David have this idea uh, that maybe what's going on is anomalies are real things. There are variables that can predict future abnormal returns. But what happens is, as soon as they're discovered, as soon as someone writes about them, what ends up happening is arbitrageurs set about trying to trade on them, and then they go away, right? So what's going on in their view is asset pricing anomalies are discovered, people trade on them, they go away. On the other hand, a couple of people, Lu Zhang, Cam Harvey, have basically argued something much more, I guess I should say, pessimistic. What they've said basically is anomalies are not real, they never were. What's going on here is there are spurious correlations in the data. It's data mining, right? Either intentionally or accidentally. The idea being, if you look at the data hard enough and you look at enough things, you're just going to find some things by random chance, right? And I always tell my students uh, about a website. If you Google the words spurious correlation, the first thing that comes up is a website uh, that has all these great graphs about ridiculous correlations. Uh, for copyright reasons, I didn't put them in, the, in my slides. But uh, one of my favorite ones is a, is a graph which shows, over time, the number of drowning deaths in US swimming pools and the number of movies Nicolas Cage is in each year. And what's amazing is these things, they literally go perfect over time for about 20 years. So if you look at this, you would say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's definitely a real correlation. I mean, there's no way that could happen by random chance. But I, I challenge you guys to come up with an economic story linking those two variables, right? So a decent number of people are arguing that basically we have found these things in the data, but they're not really there. They're just spurious things that happen. If you look hard enough, you can find any of these things. So what are we going to do in this paper? Well, we want to try to investigate the nature of are these asset pricing anomalies real or not, right? That's what we would like to say something about. Now, of course, this is a challenging question. How could you possibly establish whether something's a real correlation or whether it's just kind of accidental as a result of data mining? What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to link these asset pricing anomalies to specific information releases, right, to see if that'll teach us something more about what's actually going on. And here's the idea, right? Um, thinking about whether anomalies are real or not, it's a very difficult question. It's not obvious how you would actually prove this. But what we're going to do is we're going to think about a subset of asset pricing anomalies, often based off of accounting research, 
where you see there are distinct and measurable information release dates that should be the things on which these asset pricing portfolios are formed, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at do returns kind of decay after these information release events? And the idea, if you think about it, is basically as follows. On the one hand, if asset pricing anomalies are real, if they really are a mispricing that's there in the data, I think what you would expect to see is key information comes out, arbitrageurs start trading on it very quickly, and the returns to this thing kind of decay away. Right? On the other hand, if anomalies are spurious, if they're data mining, if they're Nicolas Cage in swimming pools, you'd expect to see no such pattern. Right? There's no reason that the actual information release should show a pattern over time. So that's what we're going to do in this paper. Uh, and what do we find? Well, uh, the, the strike while the iron is hot idea is basically anomalies are real. I'll, I'll show you that they are there in the data. We see very, very clear evidence of that. So to give you kind of a big picture preview of the results, we find that they're real. We find basically that if you really closely condition on when information is released, you see larger returns, and then they decay very quickly. Moreover, one of the things we actually see is if you look over our entire sample period, it seems like things are getting arbitraged away more quickly in more recent periods. Again, I, I think maybe that's not a surprising result for many of you in this room. But it still suggests these anomalies are real. Uh, it also can help explain why they seem to have disappeared in more recent periods. Right? They're being arbitraged away much more quickly. Uh, I'll also show you some results trying to quantify kind of the magnitude of this result. Uh, I'll show you that trading very quickly on these asset pricing anomalies can generate very large abnormal returns, as much as 7% per year. Now, again, before transaction costs, so I'll talk about that later at the end. Um, but it definitely suggests these things are real in the data. And then the last thing, if I have a little bit of time, I'll talk about the fact that uh, we also see some evidence that this matters for professionals. So what we're going to do is show you some evidence that hedge funds that seem to trade more quickly also do predictably better in the future. Right? So I can look at hedge funds that seem to be trading quickly on information. It suggests that they're the ones that are more likely to make alpha in the future. All right, so big picture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the data and how we actually try to anal uh, analyze what we're looking at. And then I'm going to show you kind of two broad categories of analyses. The first one is I'm going to use what I call an event time approach. And the idea behind this is going to be basically I'm going to look at returns to different stocks at different points in time, and I'm going to line them all up at the exact same time and look at how they perform so I can see when anomalies are profitable. And then I'm going to show you what I'll call kind of more of a, a trading time approach, where I show you a portfolio strategy over time, and I show you what the results look like. Uh, and then I, if I have time, this is one of those papers where I have way too many results. I could spend several hours talking about everything we have, but I think Chris would frown upon that. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about, real quickly, some of the other things we've done uh, in, in terms of kind of testing this. OK, so big picture, as I said. Academic literature has documented more than 100 of these things, depending on how you look at it, several hundred. There's an interesting thing, though. If you go back and you look at the majority of these papers, they typically use a strategy that's pretty simple. They get information, and they annually rebalance their portfolios, typically in June. Now, why does the academic literature usually do it this way? Well, largely, it's a result of data issues. Uh, and so if you go back, I, I lifted this quote from a very famous Fama and French paper, and they basically say, to ensure that accounting variables are known before the returns they are used to explain, we basically form portfolios in June and then look farther out than that. Right? So their idea being information comes out, regardless of when it exactly comes out, we form our portfolios in June of every year. Uh, and this is what a lot of academic papers do. The advantage, it ensures there's no look ahead bias in the data. So these things are really implementable. But it comes at a huge cost, right? The information can be very stale. And I'll show you, in some cases, this approach can lead to information that is three, four, five months stale being used. right? And that has very serious implications. So what we're going to look at then is what happens if I rebalance as soon as the information actually becomes publicly available for the first time. Now, how do I do that? Well, there's a couple of things. First thing. I need to come up with anomalies where I can clearly measure where the information release is. So we're going to, you know, we're celebrating Ray's work, and, and we're going to think about accounting data. Um, 
what we're going to do is we're going to take this list of 93 existing asset pricing anomalies, and we're going to basically filter it down to the ones where all you need to form the strategy is accounting data that was clearly released at certain points in time. Right? So for example, if you look at something like the earnings to price ratio, earnings data comes out at a fixed interval. Right? But the price is constantly changing, so we're not going to look at that component. We're going to look at things like the asset growth variable, where you need assets from a firm's balance sheet. All right? uh, this is our list. We end up with nine anomalies that are pretty, pretty well known. Uh, in fact, I think you're going to hear more about asset growth and, and some of these later in the day. Uh, and these are all based off of accounting data uh, that comes out at distinct and measurable points in time. Now, there's one more thing. What we're going to do is we're going to use a database that gives us precise point-in-time information about when this key accounting data first came out. Right? Uh, and so the data we're going to use is called Snapshot. Uh, I think a few papers have used this in academia, but it's kind of surprisingly not used very often. And what Snapshot does is it contains the first moment that each accounting variable, variable by variable, was first publicly available. Okay. And why is this important? Well, let me show you, actually. There's actually huge differences between what Snapshot would tell you and what most standard databases would tell you. Uh, so for example, if I think about the asset growth anomaly, what do I need? I need the assets number from the firm. Uh, if you look at the data here, uh, over the entire period, about 53% of the time in our sample, firms reported the assets number at their earnings announcement. But if you actually look, not only across firms, but within firms, this varies quite a bit. Right? Earlier in our sample, about 18% of the time, firms announced their assets in the earnings announcement. More recently, a lot of firms have been providing detailed balance sheet information on their earnings announcement date. Right? So we need to figure out when this information first comes out. Let me give you a, a more specific uh, example. So this is Gulfmark, Gulfmark uh, Offshore. Uh, and take a look at the following things. So in 2004, if you wanted to form this asset growth portfolio, the earnings announcement date was February 26th, and there was no information whatsoever about balance sheet variables in that announcement. Uh, you would have had to wait until the 10K came out, the annual report, which was March 15th. However, if you go and look in 2018, if you look last year, the earnings announcement press release on March 29th actually contained basically the full detailed financial statements. So actually, all of the information that came out in the 10K on April 2nd was already known. It was all stale. That stuff had already been released earlier on the earnings announcement date. So Snapshot is going to allow us to pinpoint precisely when this information first became available for trading, right? when it was first publicly available. All right, so let me jump into the analyses then. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do this event time approach. So what I'm going to do is for our nine different anomaly variables, I'm going to form these long short portfolios exactly how, as they were done in the original academic papers. But I'm going to use the snapshot data to form them as soon as I actually could. Right? And we're still actually going to be a little conservative in how we do this. So if snapshot said assets data came out on September 22nd, I'm going to form my portfolio on September 23rd. Okay. So then what happens? We're going we're gonna to figure out whether the stock should go in the long or short sell, uh, side of the anomaly portfolio. Um, we're going to hold that position for one year, and we're going to look at how it performs. And as I said, what we're going to do first is I'm going to line up everything in event time. So imagine firm one has an information release here, and firm two has an information release here. What I'm actually going to do is look at their returns over the next year, and then take all those returns and then line them up so that they all occurred at the exact same event time spot. Right? And so then basically, this is not going to be an implementable strategy, but it's going to allow me to look for a broad sample across a long time period. When do anomaly strategies earn money, and when do they not? Right? So that's what we're going to look at. I'm going to show you a graphical version of the event time results for the nine different anomalies I mentioned. So on the far left of each graph, that's day zero. So we form the portfolio when the snapshot data says the information about that strategy first became publicly available. And then we plot the average returns to these strategies over time. And what do you notice? Well, the pictures are a little bit small up here. But for the majority of these, what you see 
is strong evidence that these things predict future returns over horizons of about 50 to 100 days, right? In some cases, what you'll actually notice, so if you take networking capital in the, in the dead middle of the graph there, after 100 days, not only do the strategies not do well, they actually reverse, right? Some of these actually start doing badly after 100 days. But what you can see for the most part is most of the returns are concentrated in that first couple of months, right? To make this point a little bit more clear, what we also do is we form uh, what we call a super anomaly portfolio, and I'm not actually a huge fan of that term, but we're gonna form this super anomaly. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna form a strategy that combines all nine of those signals into one, into one strategy. And I'll show you the returns to that. What do you see again? Well, now the graph is a little bit bigger. You can see the picture more clearly. Basically, in the first 100 days, this strategy does incredibly well, right? On average, it has very large abnormal returns. These are risk-adjusted returns. But then, starting at around day 100, the things start to dissipate pretty dramatically, right? The line is almost flat from day 100 out to the end of the year. So the strategies, if you get in there stale, if you get in there using stale information, they start performing badly after a, a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months. If I show you this kind of more formally, what do you see? Well, what we actually see now is even though this academic literature has recently argued that all of these anomalies are no longer present in the data, if I just look at their performance in the first 30 days after Snapshot says the data came out, almost all the anomalies look great again. They come right back, right? And again, this is inconsistent with the idea that they're just data mined and they're spurious correlations. This really suggests they are real, right? They occur in the data. Uh, so we see that eight of the nine anomalies have pretty dramatic abnormal returns in the first 30 days. On average, they earn something in the nature of kind of uh, 50 basis points to 100 basis points of abnormal returns in the first 30 days. Uh, and if you look at our super anomaly portfolio, it does actually very, very well. It has a 1% alpha per month, right, if you look at those first 30 days. So again, things look pretty good for anomalies at this point in time, right? Um, if you look farther out, what do you see? Well, as you go farther out, right, after the first 120 days, again, as the graphs would suggest, things start to get weaker, right? Uh, so over the first 120 days, first half a year, the average return is something like 2%. So annualized, now we're talking 4%. It's definitely much weaker. If you look at the first year, you see the total return is about 2%, which if you think about columns two and three and combine the information in them, that basically tells you that in the latter half of the year, these things earned nothing, right? They didn't have any abnormal returns. Uh, so it does look like these things are decaying very quickly. Now, we also are gonna look a little bit more precisely on, on, on that statement. If you look at the first 120 days and you exclude the first month, so imagine you got in this thing a month late, what would have happened? Well, you would have earned about 3% on an annualized basis, right? So you would have given up a decent amount of yield by just waiting 30 days to get into this. And then consistent again with everything I've said, imagine you got into these strategies about six months late, right? So you used information that was six months old. What do you see in that last column in the top row? There's basically nothing. So if you got into these anomalies six months late, there's no return predictability whatsoever, right? Anomalies are gone. So overall, I think these results are consistent with the idea that anomalies are real. They're not just a spurious correlation like Nicolas Cage and swimming pools. They're, they're something that is truly there in the data. But they're consistent with this idea that what's going on is arbitrageurs are actually reacting to information about the existence of a particular anomaly and trading it away, right? And it's becoming more and more competitive to earn abnormal returns from these strategies. All right, so that's kind of the event time results. The other main thing I want to talk to you about is to try to think about what this would look like in terms of magnitude if I were to try to implement it in a trading strategy. So what we're going to do is switch from the event time approach to a trading approach where I'm basically gonna form portfolios in real time and march through the data and tell you how these strategies have done, right? So again, the idea is pretty simple. If you take the asset growth anomaly, I'm gonna to go to snapshot, I'm gonna calculate the long and short legs of the portfolio each day using the information that I really would have had in, in my hands at that point in time. And then I'm gonna look how this strategy would have performed if I had ran it for 20 years, okay? 
Um, and crucially, I should also mention too that imagine uh, firm one is in my portfolio today because it had information about asset growth. Tomorrow, information about asset growth comes out for firm two. It's possible that that bumps firm one out of the portfolio, right? So as information is coming out about all firms, we can update what's going on in the portfolio. So what do the results look like if we do this as an actual trading strategy? Well, I'm going to compare this to the standard academic method, where I rebalance in June, right? What happens if I rebalance in June? Well, let's take an example of Reliant Energy. So on February 28th of 2007, Reliant Energy files its annual report. And according to that information, uh, it turns out, based off of asset growth, we actually want to buy this stock. So under our approach, on February 29th, or if it's a leap year, I guess, or the next day, we're going to get into this position, right? Because Snapshot tells me that's when the data first came out. Now, of course, according to the traditional way of doing this in studies, they would actually say, well, at the end of June, we'll add this stock to the long leg, right? What, what then happens? Well, the next 10K for Reliant comes out on February 26th of 2008. So that's when we would end that position or update our beliefs. And if you use the traditional approach, you would wait until June of 2008 to rebalance again. So if you look at this then, what happens? Well, obviously this is a, an example I picked because it's very dramatic. But under our approach, the strategy would have earned about 44%. Under the traditional academic approach, it would have lost 21%, right? And that's the, 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 the cost of using that stale information. In this particular case, the information would have been incredibly stale. You would have been waiting all of March, all of April, all of May, and all of June before you actually implemented the strategy. And that ends up making a world of difference in terms of the performance of this anomaly. So if you want to look at this in graphical form, the first vertical line is when we get into this strategy. The third vertical line is when we would update again. The second vertical line is when the traditional June rebalancing would get you into this position. And the last vertical line is when it would update again. Why does this matter? Well, what happens is that period in between when our approach gets you into the strategy and when the traditional June rebalancing would get you into the strategy, that's where you see the strongest return predictability, right? Again, consistent with the idea that these things are real. It's just you have to think about when the information is actually coming out. So in that initial window, this strategy would do incredibly well. If you waited till June, um, you'd do reasonably well if you held for the full year. Um, but if you did June to June rebalancing, that's where you would have actually done quite poorly. Right? That's when the strategy no longer works. OK. So first thing we do, I'm going to take our nine anomalies. I'm going to use the traditional June rebalancing approach. I'm going to look at how this stuff does. What do we find? It looks pretty bad, right? And that's exactly what all these other academic papers have already said. If you look at most anomalies, they don't seem to be in the data. They're gone, right? In fact, of all of these, I think we have one or two that maybe are statistically significant. And a lot of them have signs that go the wrong way, right? So these anomalies look horrible if you use June to June rebalancing. So again, are these things real? Were they just data mined? What's going on? Well, look at what happens if we do this using our implementable uh, daily approach. So now I'm going to rebalance as soon as I can, given the information. Stocks are going to move in or out based off of what Snapshot tells me. In each of these panels, the top line shows you the total uh, compound returns for our daily rebalancing strategy over time. The bottom line shows you what they would have looked like if you did this using the annual rebalancing approach. Now, what do you see? For most of these, the top line is generally positive and generally goes up, right? What does that indicate? Well, if you use current information as it comes out, the anomalies again become tradable in the sense that they generate abnormal profits that persist over time. Um, there's a few exceptions. The networking capital one still doesn't look great. But for the most part, you see quite a bit of evidence that these things generate profitable trading opportunities. I mean, again, look at the super anomaly portfolio. That gives you kind of the most clear picture of this. That bottom line is how these strategies would have done if you had done annual rebalancing in June. The top line is what would have happened if you had traded as soon as you got the information, right? So it's a dramatic difference. 
anomalies are real, right? This is inconsistent with the idea that everything that was found before was just accidental. This suggests that really it is anomalies are tied to the release of information, and accounting for that helps you perform better. Uh, if you want to look at this in, in kind of uh, data form, our super anomaly portfolio beats the annual rebalancing portfolio by about 7% per year on a risk-adjusted basis. Now, again, before transaction costs, if I have a second, I'll, I'll talk about that part in a second. Um, but it really suggests that these anomalies are in the data because of something about information releases. Right? That's what's driving their results. That's what's driving their performance. OK, so. Uh, I have about five minutes left. I want to talk about a few other things. One of the things we talked about was this idea uh, that if anomalies are real, then hedge funds that trade on this stuff quickly should perform better than hedge funds that trade more slowly. So what we would like to see is can I learn something about the performance of hedge funds that, again, confirms that trading on anomalies quickly is valuable. Now, unfortunately, I have yet to find a, a hedge fund that's willing to give me all their trading data. But if any of you are, are welcome, you're, you're welcome to, to let me know if you want to share that. Um, so what we're going to do is I can't actually see precisely when funds trade on information. So I'm going to have to try to infer which funds are doing it quickly. How do we do that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a strategy that basically goes long the daily rebalancing strategy that I developed and goes short the traditional annual rebalancing strategy. And that's going to give me a series of returns over time that are basically, what's the extra value of trading quickly at each point in time? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at hedge funds, fund by fund, and I'm going to look at the correlation between their performance and my fast minus slow portfolio. Right? The idea being if this fund earns money when my strategy earns money and loses money when my strategy loses money, then it's reasonable to assume they're doing something similar to my strategy. Right? Then what are we going to do? Well, that's going to give me that correlation is going to basically give me a measure of which funds seem to be the ones that trade on fast information and which funds aren't. And I'm going to look and see, does that tell me something about the fund performance? And so what I'll do is I will predict future hedge fund alpha using that speed measure. And what do we see? Both within funds over time and across funds, funds that are faster predictably generate more alpha. Right? Again, in some sense, not surprising. But again, it suggests that these asset pricing anomalies are real. Right? And the funds that are better at trading on them quickly predictably do better in the future. Right? You can predict that that fund will generate more alpha going forward. All right, so I'm almost out of time. So the last thing I want to do is just real quickly discuss the uh, plethora of other analyses we have in the paper that I don't have time uh, to really get into. We've looked at a ton more things. One of the things that is most interesting, and I, and I wish I had more time to discuss, is if you look at our event time results, we actually see that things have changed in the most recent portion of our sample. So those pictures I showed you suggested that overall, returns seem to dissipate at around 100 days. If you look over the last, say, five or 10 years, that becomes more like in the first two weeks, returns dissipate. So it looks like what's happening is arbitrageurs are impounding information more and more quickly in the more recent periods in our sample. Right? It's becoming even harder to trade on these anomalies. We find a bunch of other things. Um, one of the interesting things is some people have argued that anomalies really only exist in the, in the microcap stocks that are very hard to trade in. What we actually see is our results look very similar for microcap, small cap, and large cap stocks. Um, the results, the magnitudes are a little different, but the general pictures look the same, which again suggests anomalies are real across all of these. We also look at a couple of different measures of arbitrage risk. Stocks that are riskier to trade, riskier to arbitrage, they actually tend to have um, more mispricing. So we see that the anomalies do better in those stocks. Again, that suggests they're real. We also see that stocks that have very low arbitrage risk tend to be the ones where traders seem to arbitrage away the result more quickly. Right? Those are the ones where these results dissipate very quickly. Uh, and then the last thing is I want to talk just for a second about transaction costs. So obviously, uh, I showed you that this strategy earns something like 7% per year in terms of risk-adjusted returns. But that was before thinking about transaction costs. 
Uh, the point, I think, of our paper is to understand whether or not anomalies are real or not. And so in that sense, I'm not as uh, concerned about transaction costs. The simple fact that trading on information more quickly generates more returns suggests anomalies are real. But if you are interested in kind of understanding the transaction cost thing, we've done a few things. Um, one thing that actually surprised me is if you really look at our strategy, uh, the turnover is actually not as high as you'd think it is. The turnover of our daily rebalancing actually ends up being only about 30, 40% more than the turnover of the annual rebalancing. Most of the gains from our strategy actually come just from the fact that we're trading right after the information is released. There's not a lot that comes from us kicking stocks in and out all the time, right? So turnover is actually not that high. But we're doing a couple of other things. So we're doing a more direct approach of trying to estimate transaction costs right now. That should be in the next version of the paper. And we're also trying to estimate the capacity constraints of everything that we've done, just to try to get an idea of how much money could actually be put into these strategies. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have those results right now. But they should be in the next version. So big picture, as, as Bruce said, you've got to strike while the iron is hot. The results basically suggest that anomalies are real, right? They're not just data mined. They're actually existing in the data. Uh, and basically what we see is if you trade more quickly, you earn larger returns. What does that mean? These things are not compensation for systematic risk. They're not spurious correlations. They're real in the data. And they're basically a result of delayed information reaction. Thank you. I'm uh, continuing the Australian accounting theme, because I'm an Australian accountant. And uh, actually, Ray Ball and I uh, did cross paths. We were both at Rochester together. I was a PhD student, and he was a professor. And I took one of his classes. It was actually introductory accounting. And it was very influential, actually, on my whole career. So I really appreciate being able to have you as a mentor in uh, my uh, PhD program and generally so um, anomaly time. Uh, another title could be Early Bird Gets the Worm, is the, the title I thought of when I was thinking of the paper. So um, you know, what is an anomaly? I think we all know here. It's based on uh, the maintained assumption is efficient market hypothesis, which basically says stock prices reflect quickly all available information. And there are no under or overvalued stocks. So an anomaly is any evidence inconsistent with this hypothesis. And usually the causes of anomalies can be attributed to something, some violation of underlying portfolio theory assumption. And I've sort of highlighted them in green and blue there just because some of them relate to uh, investor behavior. So uh, the underlying theories are that investors are rational, wealth maximizing, risk averse, want a higher return for more risk. Um, everyone agrees on the expected return, and then everyone has the same access to information. So these are more like the market friction type issues. Taxes and trading costs are, um, don't influence decisions and those kind of things. So, um, so when I look at this paper and when my discussion that follows, I'm going to really take it from three different perspectives. And the first is coming from this efficient market hypothesis perspective, where as... Um, we, were talk we just talked about um, abnormal returns are uh, viewed as being fake. You know, they're due either to risk factors, t-hacking, some kind of selection bias in what the uh, researcher did, or perhaps there's a look-ahead bias. The other perspective you can take is, well, you know, markets would be efficient except for market frictions. And so the, the kind of market frictions that you can have, uh, like, uh, based on investor recognition, maybe investors do not aren't aware of all the stocks, or they don't have information on stocks, so they don't trade. There's taxes, transaction costs. It's hard to short sell, so you might see uh, anomalies or uh, returns on the downside. Um, and then you can see anomalies, but maybe there's no market depth in these stocks. So this is kind of issue with uh, small stocks. How much volume can you actually put through them? And then, you know, incentives and mandates and regulation, you know, there's things that are going to stop sophisticated investors being able to get into some of these stocks. And the final view will be from a behavioral view. And this is just like uh, a different perspective altogether because it's sort of saying, well, look, markets are just not efficient because investors can be, behave irrationally. They can under or overreact to information. They can fixate on numbers. They've got limited attention. And then there can be enough 
retail investors in the market who are naive or overconfident that they can influence prices. So quite a different perspective there. So when we look at anomaly time, uh, the first thing that you, the paper that is, uh, the first thing that they point out is, hey, anomalies are real. So this is quite inconsistent with the efficient market hypothesis. So their paper does provide support for these theories because most of the anomalies that Matt discussed uh, are based on some kind of fixation. They also support the uh, market friction type view because, as Matt pointed out, you need to trade quickly to earn these returns. And so it gets back to the efficient market hypothesis that markets have become more efficient over time. So basically, you can see the little happy face there. I think the paper is satisfying to all people. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can, in the room can agree. We're, we're all happy now. So I like that about the paper a lot. Um, and that went through uh, the research design, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, just about how we perform portfolios, and it was based on these anomalies. And, um, you know, he also went through the timing of the information release, so how much information you get at the earnings announcements versus in the 10K, how much you're going to learn. And a lot of the anomalies, you know, you need balance sheet information for. Um, when we have a look at the um, results, which I've highlighted and read up there, uh, basically um, uh, more accurate timing gives you a higher return. So you're getting much more boost. If you get in there quickly, um, you're going to get a higher return. And the other thing that I didn't talk about too much, which I found quite interesting, was just that there's more significant returns in the first five days after the information's released. And this is particularly so in the later time period. So from 2008, 2017, you really have to get in quite quickly after the information's released. So uh, for some strategies, you know, within 20% uh, or 40% of the uh, return is being earned in the first few days. So that's why the early bird gets the worm kind of analogy. Um, and, the, and this uh, table three talks about the proportion of the return. So uh, now turning to my discussion, and the first perspective I'm taking is just from the EMH approach. Um, and the first comment I'm just going to make there is, well, how do we recon reconcile the need for fast trading with some of these anomalies, such as profit margin and sustainable growth, where it seems like the abnormal returns can take a long time to come out. So um, in this sustainable growth paper, at the bottom you'll see that the authors themselves say additional tests indicate the sustainable growth effect is attributable to risk and not mispricing. So they're saying it's a risk factor. And um, the man of the moment today, Ray Ball, has a, a paper that basically talks about the profit uh, margin anomaly as well and comes up with a better measure and basically points out that it seems like the returns can be earned over 10 years. So, you know, I had a hard time with the paper just reconciling these, these two effects going on. You know, why do we have to get in so fast if it's a risk factor or it lasts so long? Um, the other comment from this perspective is, well, the selection of the anomalies investigated in the study are not random. And so the study has selected uh, the, the particular anomalies that maybe they would find some results for. Um, and, and the key point is that none of the anomalies involve a valuation matter, such as market to book or earnings to price or momentum. And a paper by Richard Sloan uh, talks about these anomalies, the market to book price earnings, and basically goes back and has a look at the data and finds uh, no evidence that there's, you know, uh, superior returns to these strategies. And in fact, the reversals come from the fundamentals, not from the stock returns in the future. So, uh, you know, as an EMH perspective, you might say, well, why didn't you look at, look at these anomalies that are being questioned and, um, you know, look around the reversals of the fundamentals and see whether you find anything there. And maybe you won't find anything because they aren't anomalies. Um, turning now to the behavioral perspective that, you know, investors uh, fixate on earnings or limited uh, attention, 
what stri struck me from this perspective was, uh, well, surely if you want to trade quickly, then you want uh, investors to be underreacting to news. So wouldn't the most powerful test be the post earnings announcement drift or analyst uh, forecast revisions? But these anomalies are not investigated. So I was just kind of curious about that, since they seem to be the you know, famous underreaction anomalies. Um, then turning to uh, the accrual anomalies, um, the authors look at accruals, networking capital, inventory growth, and asset growth. And these, uh, from an accounting perspective, these are all uh, very similar constructs, and they're highly correlated. And Scott Richardson and Richard Stone again have a paper, uh, Richardson, Stone, Solomon, and Tuna, where they come up with a better measure of accruals the, uh, based on net operating assets. And this one they show has a uh, more estimation error in it and leads to lower earnings persistence. So it seemed like this one should have been the one that they were going to look at if they wanted to uh, focus on this type of anomaly. And another curious fact was, and Matt brought this up, when you have a look at the graphs like of accruals or uh, working networking capital, you see that there's, they sort of earn a higher return and then they, the return goes down. So, you know, it seems like you lose money if you hold it for too long over this point. So I was wondering whether we need some new behavioral theories just on quant screens, you know, other, the screens, the computer's now making mistakes, you know. Um, so do quant screens fixate or overinvest in accrual, the accrual trading strategy? Um, and then uh, Matt talked about having this super portfolio where it uh, equally weighted each of the uh, different anomalies, but some, some, there seemed to be so much overlap between the anomalies, I was wondering, well, what kind of weighting are you really giving in this strategy if you've got the uh, accrual strategy in there almost like four times and the profit margin in there twice? But that's not a big deal. Um, then from a market friction perspective, I think the, uh, the study is very interesting because the time series trend suggests that investors have better access to information, uh, the cost of trading has decreased. Um, it seems like it's probably easier for retail investors to trade. And, and the results also suggest that there's greater use of quantitative investors, investment investor screening in the later period. Um, and you need to get into it fast. So I thought, well, what, you know, this is really interesting. I wonder, you know, what are the implications for the future on this? And here's a picture of earnings announcements by day. And I've got it for the year 2000 and then the year 2018. And what you can see is that uh, earnings announcements are getting more clustered in time. You know, so on the uh, 2018 graph, there's a lot of really high red spikes where a lot of firms are announcing on the same day. And if we have a look by week of the year, you see the same thing that since 2000, in 2018, a lot more firms are clustered in the same week. They're announcing in the same week. So you're getting a lot of information arriving at you know, very specific weeks where you're gonna be very busy, um, or your, your computers will be very busy, I guess, updating it, uh, all these models. And even uh, looking at the day of the week, uh, if you're in a busy week, a Thursday is gonna be a very busy day, because usually firms announce after hours, and so there's not going to be any happy hours on Thursdays for those, for those days. So, you know, and you wonder about individual investors too. You know, they have to be very busy if they want to get into any of these strategies. So uh, some of the implications for anomaly time. It seemed like when you looked at some of those, uh, the graphs, that there's, less, there's more dispersion of announcements for the fourth quarter or annual earnings. Um, than in the other quarters. So it suggests, you know, that it's probably easier, the processing costs and portfolio updating might be easier for annual earnings than for quarterly earnings news, especially, you know, if they're occurring on a Thursday. Um, and maybe it's easier to process things if they're occurring on a Monday or Friday when there's less firms announcing. Um, there's also research out there that suggests that investors focus on the first firm in the industry announcing earnings and then infer earnings news for the other firms uh, that are, have, are in the similar line of business. And these results suggest that investors can ignore firm-specific uh, news, you know, the late announces that the market tends to ignore it a bit more. 
and it suggests the anomalies could be stronger for the um, late announcers. And this is just showing the number of firms, and Matt talked about this a little bit, about just uh, the, this uh, concern with the micro stocks. So you can see that the number of firms on the exchanges has declined over time. And this graph here just shows the proportion of each type of firm. So I've just uh, categorized them to large cap, over 10 billion, mid cap, between 2 and 10 billion, small cap, between 300 million and 2 billion, and then the micro cap. And you can see that what's really left the market is the, the micro cap, the uh, stock under $300 uh, million. And this is just a breakdown of those stocks. So the uh, nano cap, the ones under 50 million, are kind of ex exited out of the market in recent times. But you've also seen this big decline in the micro cap. And so the issue like, that I find interesting, or just that the proportions change too. So this is just showing that the proportion of stock that are small is much less. And so for the anomaly time, I think this is kind of an interesting area. Rather than just controlling for it, I think it would be really interesting to see how much that has impacted the strategies over time. And, um, you know, they've looked at, they looked at it and broke it down by uh, uh, percentiles, just looking at ranking things each year based on percentiles where they fit. But I think just looking at actual the market values would be kind of interesting too, just to see, well, we know that... Uh, Quant uh, investors tend to like to invest in caps that are over $100 million or something. So what's going on is that what's going on with the smaller cap ones? Are they the ones that are having the biggest problems or are more, you're more likely to make money in? Um, and then, you know, what's happened to those lost stocks? So did the micro and nano stocks in the past get priced much more inefficiently, but now they're no longer in the sample, and so that's why anomalies are going away? Is it really what I'd be interested to know is are they now being, all these little stocks, being valued inefficiently by private equity? Because you kind of hear that private equity loses a lot of money. Well, we, we can't invest in it because we, they're not available. And finally, just looking at um, the changing market composition, there's been a, a huge growth in technolo the technology sector over the 2008-2017 time period. And with technology stock, they have tend to have negative... Uh, working capital, so I've got a picture of Jenny Chu, who's a former student of mine, who did her dissertation on this. And so you, you, you would not expect the accrual anomaly, the inventory anomaly, working capital assets, or even asset growth necessarily, to be applicable to these firms in technology, since as they grow, they have declines in working capital. And so you wouldn't expect this overvaluation, inflated asset accrual effect to be working for those firms. So in summary, I think that the Anomaly Time is a, a very pleasing paper. It kind of hits on all three areas, um, the EMH, behavioral theories, and market frictions. And, um, and I think it's you know, very well worth reading, and I enjoyed it a lot. I, thanks, it was a nice paper. Uh, thank you. The question I was trying to ask you earlier was a very simple uh, one for information. Uh, when you talk about days, you talk about trading days or calendar days? Ah, uh, so those graphs are actually in calendar days. They are calendar days, so They're 100 calendar. days is about just over three months? Yeah, three months. Okay, yep. uh, the more serious question is that you kept talking about building portfolios uh, from these things, uh, but you didn't say how you built them. I'm guessing they were equally weighted? So in the main results, they're equally weighted. It turns out, and, and maybe you talked about this a little bit, when, when we kind of think about the small stock effect too, we've also looked at these in value weighted. They get a tiny bit weaker if you do value weighted portfolios, but actually they don't change all that much. Value weighted, you mean cap weighted? Cap weighted. Okay, you, yep. didn't, you didn't try optimizing at all to try and maximize we, exposure to We the... did not, we did not. So, so this was kind of just uh, you know, bare bones, nothing fancy to see if the anomalies were there. All right, thank you. Yeah, you, 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 it's certainly possible you could do better than what we did. Did, um, did you look um, at your results separately for news that was released on earnings announcement dates versus the 10K releases? Hmm. And you can kind of like argue a little bit both ways. On the one hand, um, you made a comment earlier on about some information in the past wasn't released on earnings announcement dates. Um, and was only released in 10 Ks. So if people kind of had some systematic program to just pick it up in 10 Ks, they you know may overlook it, and there may be you know more more a boost for people who do pay attention on earnings announcement dates. On the other hand, you can say, 
Well, the days when people really pay attention is on earnings announcement dates, and they overlook the 10K yeah. information. So, so you can argue both ways. And it's interesting because on our side, we've done some analysis too. And it's nice, you know, with the discussion um, afterwards. Um, when you look at, like, um, just, you know, returns for stocks on earnings announcement dates versus non-earnings announcement dates, they're obviously magnitudes higher because information gets released into the markets. Um, but I don't think anyone has really looked at, you know, the sure. releases of the 10 case. Yeah, so no, so we, have, we haven't looked at that, but I like that idea a lot, actually. So I think maybe that'll, that'll be something we can add is to see whether is it, there is a difference between the earnings announcement days and the... Uh, uh, the 10K days and whether yeah, people process that information differently. A, a paper by you and Zhang, right, that looks at the 10K and okay. finds there's like a little bit of in, inefficiency in incorporating the information. But that was in an older time period, so I don't know right. how it works now. Right. So when we are talking about anomaly and a, a, a normal return, we are implicitly, uh, implicitly assuming that we have a correct asset pro, uh, pricing formula model. That's so right. how did you? Uh, calculate your abnormal return and what, what pricing model did you use? Yeah, so, so that's also a fair point, right? It's not clear what the correct asset pricing model is, and since we're looking at abnormal returns, you know, that's, that's a relevant question. In the main results I showed you, it's Fama French three factor. We've also looked at uh, both five factor models, and you get pretty similar results. Uh, you know, my view again, I mean, maybe this is a little uh, pedantic, but in some sense, if you're just trying to answer the question, are anomalies real or not? Uh, the fact that they kind of seem to be larger, closer to information releases is, I think, evidence that they're real, regardless of the asset pricing model that you use. But certainly, I think it's more interesting if, if, uh, if we're talking about abnormal returns, and so that it's not a function of the asset pricing model. 